I am Linda Barrett, and I'm with the Genealogy, Local History, and Archives Unit at the Fort Worth Public Library. I've got a couple of housekeeping things to bring up first before we get started. Um, thank you for watching our little promo reel. We do have one other program I'd like to call your attention to. It is in celebration of Native American Heritage Month. Um, it's Welcome to the Circle, Native Culture and Family Remembrance. And it will be presented by Fort Worth Public Library staff member, Cliff Takawana. It's going to be next Saturday, the 14th at 11 a.m. Um, you can find information, the Zoom link for it on the library's website. Um, so also, if you have questions during today's presentation, you can go ahead and type them in at any time, but please be aware that they will be answered at the end of the presentation in the order that we receive them. So now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Leanna Schooley, Executive Director of TCU's Center for Texas Studies. And with that, Leanna. Thank you, Linda, and good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Preserving Our Past lecture series. Um, today, we have a really great program for you, but I just have a few notes before we start. Uh, one is I want to uh, express our gratitude to the Summerfield D. Roberts Foundation and the Summerlee Foundation who allow us to uh, bring you great speakers like Dr. Rivas today. Um, I want to mention that if you would like to know more about the uh, Center for Texas Studies, you can check out our website, texasstudies.org, and you can follow or friend us on uh, Facebook or on Instagram, where we talk about all sorts of different Texas history and culture topics and other events that are going on uh, around our area and the state. So you'll, you can sign up for that. Also, uh, you can, uh, uh, if, by signing up today, we'll add you to our mailing list where you'll get a, a very friendly, uh, no spam, uh, announcements from us uh, about uh, the events that will be going on periodically and book releases, things like that. Uh, I want to mention that our next program, which is December 5th. Um, we'll be featuring our very own Linda Barrett from the Fort Worth Public Library, and her topic will be Cowtown Strategy, Planner James Toll's Urban Designs for Fort Worth. So you, there you will learn a little bit more about the forces that have shaped the city that we live in today. I think it's going to be a super interesting look into um, Mr. Toll's influence on our city. Um, with that, I want to uh, introduce uh, Brennan Gardner Rivas. Uh, she is a, a 2019 graduate of TCU, uh, a colleague and friend of the Center for Texas Studies for a long time. And uh, she uh, is currently, and let me sh make sure I get all this in, the Clements Fellow for the Study of Southwestern America for the Clements Center at SMU. Uh, this fellowship is allowing her to uh, turn her dissertation into a book, and you are going to get a preview of that today. Um, she has also been published in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. She uh, wrote An Unequal Right to Bear Arms, State Weapon Laws and White Supremacy in Texas, 1836 to 1900. Now today, she is going to give you uh, an interesting look at our historic deadly weapons laws in Texas in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, so with that, um, oh, oh wait, I do wanna mention one thing. I wanna tell you that in case you have to um, head out of our webinar early, this program is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel uh, after a little bit of time for editing. So, uh, so you wanna remember that. With that, I give you Dr. Brennan garner Rebus. Brennan? Thank you very much. That's a lovely introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here and I'll go ahead and see if I can share my screen. All right. Uh, well, I'd like to start off today by addressing the current perceptions of Texas as a gun-friendly state um, and I assume that none of you will find any of this information surprising. So here we see two scorecards or rankings of Texas. One of them, the one on the left in blue, is from a gun control advocacy organization called Giffords. 
named for former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who uh, survived an assassination attempt in 2012, Giffords is a well-funded lobbying organization that attempts to act as a counterweight to the NRA. Uh, Giffords ranks Texas near the bottom in terms of safe and responsible gun laws um, and grades the state's policies as an F overall. Um, we're not quite in the bottom 10, but they count us as the uh, within the bottom 15 or 16. Uh, sadly, the NRA does not uh, do assessments like this, so I can't hold up an NRA example um, to, con to compare it to for you. But I did locate this ranking, which was put together by a career information site called Zipia. Uh, Zipia created a formula for assessing gun friendliness, which took into account the strictness or laxity of gun laws. And we can see, according to Giffords, that Texas is notorious for pretty lax gun laws. So they took that, that into account, combined with what's called per capita gun ownership. Um, just a note, per capita gun ownership, if you'll look here at the screen, it says 20.79 right here. Um, it, that doesn't mean 20 guns per person in Texas. That would be a whole lot. Um, it actually means 20 guns per 1,000 people. That's how statisticians uh, assess guns per capita. So they take into account the relative laxity or strictness of laws combined with uh, per capita gun ownership, as well as the economic footprint of the gun industry within the state in question. And in their assessment, Texas is the third most gun friendly state in the country. Um, I particularly enjoy the brief description there at the bottom, um, which aptly summarizes most people's perception of Texas as a pro-gun state. And that little description, for those of you who are listening and not seeing, um, it starts off with, surprised to see Texas in the top 10 list? Well, then you don't know Texas. Um, this perception may be true today, but things haven't always been that way. What if I told you that around 1910, shortly before states like New York began implementing laws that required a license in order to purchase a handgun, that Texas boasted some of the toughest, strongest, and most ambitious gun laws in the country. Would you believe me? My goal today is to get you to. And even if I do, you may end up wondering, if that's true, then how on earth did we get to where we are now as the third most gun-friendly state in America? Uh, that's a good question, and I'll share some of the conclusions that I have come to over the course of studying this topic for the past five years. <clears throat> so where did Texas gun laws come from? The phrase gun law might seem straightforward to us, guns that, uh, laws that regulate the ownership, possession, or use of firearms. Um, <clears throat> but when we look back in time, this is actually a much more complicated phrase. Um, today's gun laws, especially those requiring a background check prior to a firearm purchase, usually apply to all firearms. That means rifles, shotguns, handguns, as well as the AR type or assault type weapons uh, that are so controversial today. Historically, however, that was not the case. Rather, laws at the state or local level targeted the small, handheld, easily concealable weapon that people, let's be honest, men, used when they got into a scuffle. These deadly weapon laws applied to pistols, yes, but they also applied to other small weapons. In Texas, the definition of deadly weapons mirrored language that was common in other states. And here's the, the phrase that pops up again and again. Any pistol, dirk, sword and a cane, spear, bowie knife, or any other kind of knife manufactured or sold for the purpose of offense or defense. Meanwhile, few regulations applied to muskets, rifles, or shotguns because they were rarely used in fist fights that turned deadly, and they were also so heavy and clunky as to be nearly impossible to conceal within a coat. And if you haven't had the pleasure of doing this in your life, uh, it is astonishing to actually pick up and hold an antique musket. I got to hold a late 18th century antique musket. It was so heavy, I don't think I would have been able to fire it even if I knew how to. So uh, there were distinctions between long guns and these smaller concealable weapons. So applying the phrase gun laws as we conceive of it today is certainly hampered by this division of firearms into two categories, one of which came under regulation while the other did not. But it's also hampered by the fact that the purposes for regulating deadly weapons have changed, at least to some extent. In all cases and at all times, gun laws today or deadly weapon laws in the past are about safeguarding the community from potential threats, 
but the perceived source of those threats has changed over time. Today, we fear the person with mental health problems, as we like to call it, who might get an AR type weapon, um, or the, we fear the longtime domestic abuser who might turn his handgun on his family. But in the 19th century, the sources of perceived threat by the movers and shakers of society, the people whose voices and votes animated governing institutions were afraid of enslaved African-Americans, Indian nations who were fighting back against displacement by Anglo white settlers, and the rowdy uncouth men who settled their differences through lethal force rather than legal procedure. And when we look at historic deadly weapon laws, and in particular, the kinds of regulations that were enacted during the antebellum era, this fear of slaves, Indians, and what we can call lowbrow men becomes quite clear. So we'll tackle each one of these three really quick. So let's talk about our rowdy lowbrow men um, and laws that, that were uh, targeting them. Uh, in the 1740s, so we're talking very, very early in the colonization of Texas. Uh, Texas was part of New Spain and San Antonio or the, the villa or via of San Fernando was a brand new, uh, brand new settlement. Um, and so during the 1740s, the ruling mayor whose position was called Alcalde, which you can see there on the slide, um, the Alcalde of uh, San Fernando or San Antonio banned the carrying of small arms within the town limits. Um, so we see, uh, we see municipal authority to regulate guns to some extent going almost all the way back to the beginning of colonization in Texas. In the 1820s, when Texas was part of Mexico, Anglo immigrants conformed, at least in part sometimes, to the political system of Mexican local governance. And that involved um, local ruling councils that were called the Ayuntamiento. Um, and Anglo, uh, Anglo colonists or, or settlers actually called upon at times the local Ayuntamiento council to ban the carrying of concealed weapons within town limits. So even in the 1820s, Anglo white Texans see their municipal governments in Mexico as having the authority to do this. In the 1840s, when Texas was still an independent republic, uh, lawmakers forbade dueling. Uh, this was not quite a ban on carrying weapons, but it was certainly a way of telling men that even though they might be able to own and carry weapons, they could not use them for the number one purpose they were designed for, which is lethal encounters in particular to avenge one's honor. Um, in the 1850s, a vocal movement in favor of weapon restrictions uh, tried mightily to enact a statewide ban on carrying concealed weapons. Laws of this nation, nature, nature were common across the American South and Trans-Mississippi West, and it would have succeeded in Texas, I'm sure of it. Uh, they were gaining ground all across the decade of the 1850s, but this little thing called the Civil War intervened and derailed their concealed weapons movement. Um, <clears throat> That same decade of the 1850s, the reform movement supporting a concealed weapons ban did have one achievement. They didn't get their main goal, what they wanted, but they got something else, kind of a consolation prize. Um, and that was a law that the legislature passed, which said that manslaughter committed with a Bowie knife would be prosecuted as though it were first degree murder. And here we have an array of various types of Bowie knives. Um, <clears throat> this was an indirect way of accomplishing what the reformers wanted to do directly through a concealed weapons ban, but could not. They wanted to discourage men from carrying weapons that might be turned to lethal purposes during an argument. <clears throat> Rowdy men with weapons posed a threat in the 1860s, though, all, as we all might recognize, the legislature was focused on other things. But in the aftermath of the Civil War, municipalities began banning concealed weapons within city limits themselves. They saw this as a way to quell the rampant violence that was taking over much of the state. Galveston led the way in 1866 and others followed suit. Within a few years, city charters issued by the legislature specifically authorized city councils to regulate the carrying of weapons within city limits. So when Galveston did it, the charter didn't technically say that they could, but it importantly, didn't technically say that they couldn't. Um, and with Galveston leading the way, that changed the, the language and changed some of the specific uh, authorizations that the legislature passed down to municipalities through their charters. So that's a little bit about 
antebellum laws or, or early laws that apply to rowdy or uncouth men. Uh, the second fear uh, was a fear of Indians or fear of Native Americans. Laws as early as the 1830s strictly prohibited the selling of arms and ammunitions and ammunition to Indians under the assumption that all tribes were untrustworthy and might use these weapons to carry out attacks on Texan settlements. Some Indian tribes tried to be on friendly terms with Texas and its settlers, whether they were Tejanos, Mexicans, or Anglos. Uh, the most notable would be the Cherokees living in East Texas under the leadership of Chief Bowles, who we see pictured here. There were other communities, mostly sedentary and agricultural, who also maintained good relationships um, and they were at times able to obtain arms and ammunition through Texas traders. This was especially true um, during periods when they fought alongside Texas Rangers or later army regulars against the Comanche and Wichita groups who were being displaced by settlers who were establishing farms and ranches along the fertile river valleys in central and north Texas. The final group that we see uh, a fear of in our early gun laws uh, is enslaved African Americans. Across the South, slave revolts were a very real and pressing fear. Um, eventually, slaveholding societies uh, codified the practices that governed the institution of slavery, and these were called slave codes. The Texas Slave Code was written in 1840, and it punished slaves who carried weapons or even potentially deadly tools like hammers without the permission of a master or overseer. This conditional arming policy was fairly common across the American South. Now, as the enslaved population of Texas grew over the next 20 years, between 1860, um, plantation elite Texas in the coastal plains actually tried to revoke this conditional arming policy and forbid masters from allowing slaves to carry weapons at all. That's why I put up this map for you. This is an excellent map from uh, the historic Atlas of Texas by uh, uh, A. Ray Stevens. Um, and this, this uh, particular map is from 1860. And when you look at it, it's somewhat counterintuitive because the darker the county is, the fewer slaves there were, whereas the, the brighter counties with, with Harrison and bright red here leading the way, the brighter counties had larger slave populations. So I wanted to give you a little map of that. Um, <clears throat> this effort to uh, take away the conditional arming policy for masters, it ended up failing because slave owners in areas further north and west, those darker counties that had fewer numbers of slaves and were more on the, the edge of Anglo settlement, um, they wanted the right to arm their slaves if it became necessary. Much as we conceive of the antebellum south as a place characterized by black-white tension, which is true, in Texas, the continued threat of Indian attacks, uh, it actually shattered that traditional black-white paradigm. Though the slave-master relationship was certainly one of mutual mistrust, uh, their interests could align in fending off Indian raids through the force of arms. Uh, so that's what prevented the taking away of this uh, conditional arming policy that characterized slavery in Texas. Uh, free black persons, there were not all that many of them in Texas, um, they were not allowed to serve in the militia, but other than that, there was no, there were no special rules that applied to them. Um, there were no special restrictions upon their right to purchase, possess, or use weapons for lawful purposes. In many, many other Southern states, uh, free Blacks had to go through a licensing policy in order to uh, legally own or use a firearm. Now, after the Civil War, enslaved persons became free and the old uh, conditional arming policy of the slave code no longer applied to them. Um, and from 1865, the year the Civil War ended, through 1867, the very same men who ran the state before and during the war, the very same men who for the most part supported secession in the Confederacy were still running the government. They lost the war, but they held on to the reins of state power. These men tried to recreate that conditional arming policy and apply it to freedmen um, through a law that was part of the state's black code. That law said that a tenant could not keep a firearm without his or her landlord's permission. Now I'll give you one guess as to who were, or what was the largest class of tenants in Texas in 1865 to 67. Well, of course, it was the men and women who had been emancipated in 1865, uh, most of them still living on the lands of their uh, of their old masters. Uh, 
Uh, so this law clearly targeted them. Um, it seems to me that it was more of an intimidation tactic than an enforceable law. And I don't know that a whole lot of arrests were made under its authority. And by the end of the 1870s, it was such a dead letter that it was dropped entirely from the state's penal code. So these are the laws pertaining to the purchase, possession, and use of guns and other deadly weapons through about the late 1860s. We can see that Texas certainly had a history of regulating arms and weapons in the name of public safety, um, but Texas was pretty average compared to other states, um, maybe even lagging a little behind the trends in more easterly states that had been settled by Anglo-Americans earlier on. So if I'm trying to persuade you that Texas was some sort of gun control champion, I surely haven't achieved my goal yet. Uh, but now we get to the critical turning point. A sea change occurred in the early 1870s when lawmakers enacted the deadly weapon ban, a law somewhat similar in nature to the concealed weapon bans that had failed to become law back in the 1850s. Except this time, instead of applying only to concealed weapons, the deadly weapon ban applied to all weapons carried in the public sphere, although long guns being clunky and often militia weapons were not included. This event is a critical turning point in the development of what we might call modern gun laws. Um, it aimed at, uh, it aimed at <clears throat> promoting community safety. It applied to all residents equally and it directly penalized a socially unacceptable behavior. Recall that the older laws that I just reviewed for us held community safety as the ultimate goal. Yes, because all gun laws are predicated upon that idea. However, the older laws tended to be discriminatory by targeting specific groups or classes of people deemed a potential threat, or they were indirect in that, like that Bowie knife or manslaughter by knife law, it enhanced a punishment rather than uh, directly proscribing or banning the unacceptable activity. And all of this changed in 1871 with the passage of the deadly weapon ban. This law built upon a solid foundation of previous safety focused regulations that pertain to deadly weapons and firearms. So it's building upon a solid foundation. That means no one at the time was disputing whether or not it was constitutional. Nobody at the time was disputing whether or not it was a lawful exercise of government power. And in fact, the state Supreme Court repeatedly affirmed that it was well within the bounds of the legislature's authority to regulate the carrying of weapons that were not considered militia arms. Militia arms would be rifles for the most part. Um, so these deadly weapons, the list that I showed you before and that I'll show you again in a moment, these aren't militia weapons. And so the state Supreme Court repeatedly said that it was well within the bounds of acceptable government authority to regulate them. Now, I always make sure to call this the deadly weapon ban because most of the prohibited items were various kinds of knives. Recall that this is about removing small concealable weapons from the public sphere because they are the ones that were being used in fights that turned deadly. And so these are the same weapons I mentioned before. And so I'll show you our little list again. Any pistol, dirk, sword and a cane, spear, bowie knife, or any other kind of knife manufactured or sold for the purpose of offense or defense. Now, over time, however, pistols became the most prevalent weapon of all those listed, and people sometimes referred to it as the pistol law. So here's a, a 19th century looking pistol for us. Prior to the mid 19th century, the go-to weapon for those who wanted to carry arms or carry weapons in public was a Bowie knife, uh, like the ones that I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, inexpensive, lethal, and no need to reload, these 8 to 12 inch knives were far more deadly than the single shot pistols that were the latest and greatest in firearms technology. The introduction of the Colt revolver in the 1840s initiated a slow yet revolutionary process of making pistols the go-to weapon rather than Bowie knives. Men who had the means to purchase one could easily do so, especially if they traveled to the larger cities of the South like New Orleans or the Houston or Galveston. But men who fought with the Texas Rangers, the Texas Army and Navy, and later the US Army and Navy sometimes ended up receiving these weapons and could uh, sometimes choose to keep them even after their terms of service were over. During the Civil War, many soldiers were issued Colt revolvers like the one you see on your screen. This is technically the 1873 Peacemaker model, uh, but you can imagine that the revolvers 
uh, manufactured in the late 1850s and throughout the 1860s were fairly similar in style. Um, from the 1850s through about World War I, discharged soldiers could often keep their military issued sidearms. Um, and sometimes even when they weren't supposed to keep them, they just chose not to surrender them and took them home anyway. Uh, that's certainly what Confederate officers did when they were supposed to turn over their arms at surrender ceremonies. Um, thus, veterans often possessed some of the best quality handguns in existence at the time. And there were a lot of war veterans in the late 19th century. Uh, these were often called Army Navy pistols. So the one you see here would, this is the kind of gun that would be referred to as an Army or Navy pistol because it's a type of weapon that's issued to, to soldiers. Um, and it could cost anywhere from $20 to $40, which was quite expensive in the mid and late 19th century. Technological innovation, because remember, we're also going through uh, major industrial changes, the, the, the Industrial Revolution. These technological changes made revolvers easier to produce, cheaper to purchase, and faster to ship to buyers. So the number of revolvers in American hands grew exponentially between 1840 and the early 1900s. Lower quality revolvers could actually, over time, there were these lower quality cheap revolvers and they could be ordered through the mail for as little as a few bucks and shipped to the buyer within a few days or weeks. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of this proliferation of revolvers, which occurred in the half century following the Civil War. The calls for gun laws and other regulations against pistol toters can only be understood within this context of American communities finding themselves beset by rampant gun violence for the first time. So a little, uh, a few details about our deadly weapon ban. What exactly did it do? It was a misdemeanor crime, uh, a misdemeanor crime that prohibited the carrying of our familiar list of weapons that I showed a few moments ago, um, prohibited carrying these weapons either openly or concealed beyond the confines of a person's property or place of business. So if you wanted to carry a Bowie knife or a pistol around your own property, you could. Um, if you wanted to, if you're a proprietor and you want to keep it at your place of business, you can do that. Um, the deadly weapon ban differed from similar statutes being enacted elsewhere. Most of these uh, sort of similar or comparable statutes in other states only pertain to concealed weapons, meaning that at least in theory, a person could openly carry a weapon in public, although there's some question as to whether or not that was a common occurrence uh, across much of the United States. Um, the idea was that concealment was deceptive and unmanly. Um, that's the, the sort of guiding thought behind banning concealed weapons, um, is that a real man wouldn't hide that he has a gun. That's a very feminine or cowardly thing to do. Also, uh, people might treat someone differently and avoid an argument or confrontation if they knew ahead of time that the opponent had a knife or gun and therefore might be likely to respond with lethal force. Uh, there were some exceptions to the deadly weapon ban, so no deadly weapons at all in public, um, but here are a few exceptions. They were for travelers, peace officers, and people who had reason to fear an imminent and deadly attack. That doesn't mean you could just carry a weapon and say it was for self-defense. Um, there had to be some sort of pressing threat that caused you to carry a weapon today. Um, and as you can probably imagine, um, this list of exemptions, all of these labels are subject to interpretation. Um, and in fact, they became the uh, subject of great dispute and uh, as uh, cases wended their way through the, through the appellate courts of Texas. But I wanna take a moment here, because I'm a Texan, I wanna take a moment here and give us a chance to celebrate, right? As of 1871, we see Texas becoming one of the most ambitious and far reaching regulators of deadly weapons in Texas. So uh, Texas on the cutting edge of something here in the 1870s. Now, why did Texans enact this law when they did? This marked a sharp break from the past. Um, and it's critical for us to understand the socio-political context that surrounded its passage. Reconstruction, which, which was from about 1865 through the mid 1870s, um, Reconstruction was the bloodiest era of Texas history. Murder and assault were frequent occurrences, many of them motivated by the hatred of pro-Confederate white Texans for African-Americans who had been emancipated as a result of the Civil War. 
Um, some of the post-war violence targeted people who had been loyal to the Union throughout the duration of the war. They had been mistreated throughout the conflict, but when the dust settled and the Confederacy lost, hard feelings fell upon them. Um, some of them actually sent a petition to the U.S. Congress and complained that uh, despite their loyalty during the war, they found themselves committed to the protection of the rebels after it was over. Um, and the correlation between rampant weapon carrying and lawlessness was so clear to post-war Texans that doing something about them was a bipartisan policy. That means that Democrats, most of whom had supported the Confederacy, uh, as well as members of the fledgling Republican Party, both wanted to do something about the ubiquity of guns and knives in public. In 1866, uh, Governor James W. Throckmorton, who had been a Confederate officer, uh, he said, while I would not seek to interfere with the right of the citizen at all times to bear arms in defense of himself, his property, and the state, yet I do not conceive that it was intended by the Constitution to convey the idea that men and boys, vagabonds and vagrants, were to be licensed to have arms about their persons on all occasions. Uh, so he's saying here that Yes, our state constitution might say that we have a right to bear arms, but there's a difference between, between that right to bear arms and a right to just willy-nilly carry guns and knives on your person all the time, everywhere you go. He doesn't see that as being uh, in harmony with the state constitution. Democrats like Throckmorton, he was a Democrat before the war and a Democrat later on after. Democrats were briefly called conservatives during Reconstruction. Um, but Democrats like Throckmorton tended to favor taxing the privilege of carrying a pistol in public. So they thought what we should do is tax them um, and that will discourage people from doing it. Whereas Republicans, who we'll get to in a second, they wanted to disarm everyone in this sphere and in behind the uh, Democrats had the opportunity to carry out their tax plan in 1866 uh, under Throckmorton's leadership, but they couldn't agree on what the tax rate should be. Uh, Texans were so cash poor at the time that any tax at all would disarm the vast and overwhelming majority of white men, many of whom were war veterans. So conflicts over these details derailed the whole tax project. <clears throat> so uh, I've said several times that immediately following the Civil War, the old pro-Confederates and many of the old secessionists still controlled the mechanisms of government in Texas. That changed in 1867 when the U.S. Congress took over the reconstruction process from President Andrew Johnson. That's a long and fascinating story, and I'm really resisting the temptation to go off on a, on a detour about it. So uh, I gave myself something I could put up instead. If you, uh, since we don't have time to go into all of that, I will give you the title of an excellent and very readable book that I just recently had the pleasure of reading that's about this very subject. So if you wanna learn more about that, here's, here's a great recommendation for you. <clears throat> it's called The Impeachers. But for our purposes, it is important for you to know and understand that Republicans in Congress got so angry at the intransigence of Southerners that they actually dismantled most of their governments, including the government of Texas, and made the Southern states <clears throat> start, from start from scratch again with new state constitutions, new elections, and an entire new slate of elected officials uh, for every elected office from county sheriff all the way to state governor. Um, this process allowed for the birth of a Republican party in Texas for the first time ever. <clears throat> Republicans controlled Texas government from about 1868 through 1874 and their power at the state level is best associated with this guy, uh, Governor Edmund J. Davis. He had actually been a, a union officer during the Civil War, although he was from uh, South or Gulf Coast, Texas. Um, in the few years when Republicans were at the helm of state politics, uh, they enacted a whole host of reforms that were designed to benefit non-elite whites as well as African-Americans. Uh, this was a biracial political party desperate to attract white voters and create a viable two-party system in what had long been a one-party state. As we know, their effort ultimately failed. Texas fell right back into becoming a one-party state again. Um, but they did make some accomplishments during their brief moment in the sun, and one of those was the deadly weapon ban. Now, being the only party that really made an effort to represent Black Texans, 
the Republicans cared a lot about ending the violence in Texas, especially the white on black assaults and murders that had skyrocketed after the Civil War. And I just want to reiterate to you, this wasn't just like, oh, crime rates ticked up a little bit. We're talking, we're talking rampant, widespread violence uh, across, across the state. And Texas was notorious, uh, even among other former Confederate states, as being one of the most violent um, and one of the most resistant to the process of reconstruction. Um, and of course, a lot of this violence revolved around politics. So here we see a black man voting. Um, politics and racial politics had everything to do with this violence. Um, Republicans believed that a tax on carrying pistols would not do any good. The wealthy, who were all white, many of whom ended up being in the Ku Klux Klan, um, the wealthy elites would still be able to carry weapons in public and could still use that, fire, that uh, firepower to intimidate black people and unionists who were also uh, Republicans. No, Republicans wanted a law that removed all deadly weapons from the public sphere. And that's where the deadly weapon ban came from. Now, when Republicans fell from power in the early and mid 1870s, Democrats decided to leave this particular law on the books. They repealed a whole host of other Republican enacted measures, um, but they kept this one primarily because it was a useful way of reducing tension. Banning the carrying of weapons in public actually lowered the threshold of criminal, criminal activity. You didn't have to even do anything with your pistol or bowie knife in order to be threatening the peace and breaking the law. If someone saw you with a weapon tucked in your belt, that person, he or she could report you and you would be searched, arrested, and slapped with a fine or possibly even sent to jail. Again, this was a way of lowering the threshold of criminal activity so that law enforcement officers could identify potentially problematic people before they ever actually did something to cause physical harm. The enforcement of the deadly weapon ban was uh, carried out by sheriffs, deputies, constables, and town marshals, um, and in larger cities, uh, later on, police forces. Um, this picture is not actually of a Texas sheriff. It's actually a picture of a U.S. marshal who worked in Indian territory. But he really he really uh, shows or personifies the idea of the late 19th century lawman. So I put his picture up. I selected a, a handful of sample counties throughout Texas and examined their law enforcement records because I wanted to see were they even enforcing this law, who was being arrested for it, uh, what kind of penalties were they given, et cetera. Um, and I actually found, uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the first uh, arrested person I found. So the, not the first person arrested, but the first one to show up in the records that, that I was able to access. So the first, uh, the first defendant uh, charged for unlawfully carrying a pistol that I found was a young man named Jake Dornwell of LaGrange, Texas. And on the map there, you can see Fayette County lit up in red, and LaGrange is the county seat there in Fayette County. <clears throat> Jake Dornwell is an excellent example of the kind of person who tended to be arrested for gun toting in the early decades of its enforcement. Uh, so he's very typical. So Jake Dornwell was about 20 years old in 1873 when he was arrested. Um, he grew up in Texas. He was unmarried and he owned no property. So most of the violators who I was able to find and track down, they're young men who are not married and they have no roots in their community like that. Um, he was typical in that way. Jake Dornwell though was atypical in that his father was a justice of the peace in Fayette County and was more than likely a little humiliated that his own son was among the first gun toters arrested under the deadly weapon ban. Now Fayette County is one of the best documented counties in the state. Their preservation is fabulous. They have so many records, but even they have gaps in what they have recorded. Um, and when we go back to the mid 19th century, you know, there's just holes in the records. So for this reason, we can't know what happened to young Jake uh, or whether he was found guilty or sent to jail, but he was the first one that I, that I found in the records. So as the Republican party became weaker across the decades of the 1870s through the 1890s, reconstruction is waning and falling apart and the Democrats are reinstituting their one party state uh, from the 
level of the state government all the way down to the level of local county governments across Texas. So that process played out from the 1870s through the 1890s. And as that played out, uh, we start to see a shift in how the deadly weapon ban and probably a lot of other crimes uh, were enforced. The Republican Party lost power, um, uh, lost power at the state level in the mid 1870s. But in some areas at the local and county level, Republicans hung on to some degree of political power or political voice. Um, Fayette County was one of those where Republicans held on to a little bit of power for a while. Um, <clears throat> and I have some information here. So we're talking about discriminatory enforcement. Um, this is just some basic census data for Fayette County from 1870 through 1920. And you can see that uh, the percentage, the, the number of African-Americans stays almost the same throughout. Um, but they become a smaller and smaller sliver of the county's population. Um, so that's because by the late 1880s, most of the residents of Fayette County were Anglo white newcomers who were following the opportunities that were presented by rail development arriving in the county. And many of them being from more easterly southern states or even from further east Texas, they were lifelong Democrats. Their presence reshaped county politics and all but eliminated the Republican party within the county by around 1890. Um, so as this process unfolded, the voice of African-Americans in local governance in Fayette County waned. Um, and that's when it's at that point that we begin to see discriminatory enforcement. <clears throat> I have this uh, cool little graphic here, which uh, shows us how around 1890, we start to see the, the percentage of African-Americans arrested or showing up in the criminal records for unlawful carrying, uh, they skyrocket and they are radically disproportionate to their, uh, to their representation within the county's population overall. So this is, this is the graph for Fayette County. Um, and I found a similar, though slightly less well-documented trajectory in McLennan County, just about 60 or 70 miles south of Fort Worth. So that's a little bit about the law and how it was enforced. And it's really not surprising that this law might be enforced in an equitable way starting out and target rowdy young men. But over time, as, as segregation is uh, written into law and as these Jim Crow practices are becoming more and more well-established, the deadly weapon ban gets turned into a tool of that system, that system of racial oppression. Still though, let's see, you would think that the enactment and enforcement of the deadly weapon ban, which was, as, especially at its beginning, innovative and much more far reaching than what was common in other Southern states, you'd think that this would be enough to show you that many Texans cared about regulating guns in the name of public safety. So I'd like to think that in my goal of persuading you, I've at least made some headway here. Um, but in fact, Texans didn't stop with this deadly weapon ban as it was originally written. So I have yet more ammunition to, to use to persuade you. Um, instead, a vocal gun control movement, there's nothing else you can call it. This is an apt descriptor. A vocal gun control movement during the Gilded Age and Progressive Era called for more severe punishment, better enforcement, and even additional legislation, new tactics for discouraging gun toting. So we'll talk about that here for a few minutes. It's my hope that talking about this movement and its accomplishments will fully persuade you that Texas was among the most ambitious gun regulators until the development of handgun licensure policy, policies around 1910. So the man that I credit with this movement is none other than B.B. Paddock, uh, one time mayor of Fort Worth. Uh, Paddock was born in Ohio, grew up in Wisconsin, but interestingly ended up fighting on the side of the Confederacy as a young man during the Civil War. In 1872, he moved to Texas and settled in Fort Worth. He became a booster for the city and in his persona brought together the two great socioeconomic catalysts of his age. He was a newspaper editor. His paper was called the Fort Worth Daily Democrat, and he was a railroad man. He ended up being the president of the Fort Worth and Rio Grande Railway. Um, Paddock must have kept up with events in his birthplace of Cleveland, Ohio, because in 1879, he reprinted an article from the Cleveland Register. Uh, that newspaper said, uh, it says, if the West and South would rally around the sentiment, the revolver must go, 
it would be one more step in the interest of civilization. So Paddock reprinted that and then he gave a, um, a little editorial and he said in his editorial, if the South, if Texas really desires to achieve that reputation for law and order, which has been won by some states and by some communities, the on sign raised, the banner planted, must bear the unequivocal device, the revolver must go. There is too much revolver in this country. No sincere lover of his section, no honest friend of the South can deny it. Paddock's mantra was printed in numerous other Texas newspapers and the slogan, the revolver must go, became a rallying cry uh, for the Texas gun control movement throughout the 1880s and 1890s. An East Texas paper proceeded to call upon the press and the people of the state to aid us in exterminating the pistol and bowie knife in Texas. They wanted to do this for the good of society. Commentators repeatedly voiced their belief that packing heat was the root cause of homicide. Protestant ministers preached respect for law and they actually preached against the carrying of concealed weapons. And some even took that message into the Western towns and counties that were bedeviled by outlaws. Uh, the outlaws that we all maybe heard of when we were growing up. Grand juries, when they were convened, they became a special target for reformers, uh, reformers who urged them to speak out on the subject. They said, send up reports, petitions, and appeals regarding lawlessness and crime. One district judge reminded his grand jurors uh, by saying, the day has passed when it was necessary to carry arms in this country to ensure personal safety there can now be no excuse for this violation of the law. He portrayed the deadly weapon ban as a wholesome law, he called it, whose strict enforcement will do much toward the suppression of bloodshed and murder in this section. Dozens of counties along the Western line of settlement had been exempted from the deadly weapon ban initially because in the early 1870s, Comanches still lived there and they were fighting against white settlement. Um, and the Westerly counties we can think of being around about Parker County, uh, we're, I, I North Texas. So you can think like Parker County being along this line of frontier settlement. Um, so they were initially exempted because they were still um, being attacked by Comanches. Uh, but by the late 1870s, such attacks had almost entirely subsided and residents of these fast developing counties became victims uh, of who they called lawless men uh, men who were armed to the hilt everywhere they went. Um, beyond that, these frontier county residents, um, these are some direct quotes from them, okay? The frontier re county residents said, law-abiding citizens are more liable to commit crimes when allowed to carry six shooters. That's a direct quote. It was in a petition that they sent to the, the governor. Um, in another petition, they said, residents from the surrounding areas would visit their market towns a few times a year um, on the face of it for the purpose of business, but and this is the direct quote, but principally to have a spree, okay? These perceived ne'er-do-wells unfailingly took advantage of the county's frontier exemption and carried their pistols with them everywhere they went, and they would fire them indiscriminately in the streets, thereby endangering the lives and greatly annoying the peaceable citizens. Uh, one group of petitioners got down to the nub of the issue. They said, when lawless men are disarmed, we will have no trouble in enforcing law and order. So these are people in frontier counties with exemptions asking for their exemptions to be taken away because they want their local sheriffs to be able to enforce the deadly weapon ban. And in 18, uh, 1884, Governor John Ireland obliged and he eliminated forever the frontier exemption. Supporters of gun control in Gilded Age, Texas had identified the problem, too many guns. Um, and they had achieved one success by getting rid uh, by getting rid of one of the pesky exemptions to the law, but they didn't stop there. Okay, so I have yet more ammunition to persuade you. One of the most common demands was that the crime of unlawful carrying, as they called it, be made a felony. That would mean that offenders would go to the state penitentiary in Huntsville to serve their sentence rather than to the county jail. Uh, furthermore, this gun control movement uh, consistently wanted the mandatory sentence to be raised to a term of one year. So similar to mandatory minimum sentencing that we hear about these days and has become a uh, very controversial. So they wanted a mandatory minimum of one year in the state penitentiary for someone who was found guilty of carrying a pistol. 
Um, the fact that Texas engaged in the notoriously brutal and corrupt convict lease system would mean that a young man like our James uh, Dornwell that we learned about a minute ago, he did nothing but illegally carry a pistol in the street. If the gun control reformers had it their way, they would have sent him, uh, they would have sent him away to a prison work camp for no less than a year for carrying a pistol. Now the movement never was able to get this put into law, but they did have some accomplishments and some accomplishments worth noting. So we'll talk about that here for a minute. Uh, their first accomplishment was that for a brief period of time, there was a mandatory county jail sentence for gun toting. Their second accomplishment, the state legislature in 1913 actually passed a bill through both houses saying that unlawful carrying could be classed as a felony and an option for punishment was one year in the penitentiary. Now, Governor Oscar B. Colquitt vetoed this um, and instead he offered, uh, he offered a compromise and he said, instead of that, how about we create a new felony called assault with a prohibited weapon um, which can be a felony that can carry up to two years in the penitentiary. Um, so we can consider this as a compromise measure that they ended up winning from the governor. Now, gun control reformers in Texas also looked for ways to indirectly discourage pistol toting among men. Um, if you wanna indirectly get someone to do what you want, the best thing you can, uh, you can do is tax them. So in 1907, the state legislature passed what was called the gross receipts tax. Um, it was basically an, op an occupation tax on uh, dealing in pistols. The way that it worked is that at the end of every quarter, so four times a year, all retail dealers and firearms had to report the number of pistols sold and hand over to the state comptroller 50% of the proceeds from pistol sales. This meant that it was impossible to turn a profit by selling pistols. Now, people are smart and they found ways around this. Uh, buyers could use mail order catalog companies to buy pistols instead. Um, dealers switched from selling pistols to leasing them. That was a way of skirting around the law. Uh, so <clears throat> let's take a second and think about Texas in the first decade or so of the 20th century. It's at this point when Texas not only had the deadly weapon ban, but had created assault with a prohibited weapon, as well as put a 50% occupation tax on pistol sales, it's at this moment that I wanna pause and think. Around 1910, this series of laws made Texas one of the most ambitious regulators of gun use and sales in the country. We often look at the political landscape of the gun debate today and just assume that states like New York and California and Illinois were always the pioneers of gun control simply because they are the most vocal advocates today. This is bad history, but it's an all too common mistake. In fact, states like New York, uh, and they didn't start becoming the, the pioneers of regulation until this very moment. Uh, the, the pioneering far reaching New York law, which is called the Sullivan Act, it was enacted in 1911 and required any New Yorker who wanted to purchase a handgun to go through a licensure policy first um, or a licensure procedure first. Um, <clears throat> so Texas was on the cutting edge and states like New York went a different route that Texas opted not to go into. Um, and I think I've got a photo here. Uh, these are, by this point, this is the latest and greatest in pistol technology, the semi-automatic handgun. This is a World War I era gun. Um, but Texas resisted these new licensure policies that were taking root in places like New York. These policies gave a whole lot of discretion to police and sheriffs in deciding who may purchase or carry a handgun. Um, it actually limited buyers. So saying that you can't buy one unless you go through a procedure, that was very out of step with the mentality in Texas where we see that they were far more willing to regulate sellers of guns then they were willing to regulate buyers of guns. Also, one of the exemptions within the deadly weapon ban, if you'll recall, uh, was an exemption for peace officers. This term ended up including civilians who had been deputized by the local sheriff. As you might imagine, these deputizations could be used by sheriffs to reward their friends and supporters and create a class of lawful pistol toters who might become a nuisance to local residents. In fact, that very thing happened. Uh, their experiences with discretionary carrying overseen by local law enforcement 
also made New York's Sullivan Law unappealing to Texans. So Texas also mimicked other states in the 1920s by banning fully automatic weapons, regulating new technologies like silencers, but the mantle of being among the most ambitious or effective in terms of gun control had passed to other states. In the ensuing decades, the deadly weapon ban ended up looking so antiquated that some federal level politicians, none of them Texans of course, actually said that Texas had no gun laws whatsoever. Uh, they were saying this in the 50s and 60s and it was patently untrue. Um, <clears throat> so I said, if I persuade you that Texas was at one point an ambitious regulator of guns, you might stop and wonder, well, how on earth did we get to become the third most friendly gun state in America? Right. Um, so how did we get here? Well, here's this is a this is open to interpretation. But here's my two cents from having studied this for all the time that I have. <clears throat> so gun laws ended up, af especially after the advent of, of federal gun laws in the 1930s, um, gun laws and gun regulation ended up being associated with big government or an intrusive government. And this did not mesh well with the revamped Republican Party that was coalescing in the 1970s and 1980s. The word regulation was akin to a four letter word for some Reagan era Republicans and gun laws, even, even some of those that were state level laws, they became tainted with this stain of federal interventionism. Now in Texas specifically, a hot button issue that animated the abandonment of the state's long held deadly weapon ban was the 1991 Luby's massacre. Many of you likely remember this tragic incident where a man entered a Luby's in Killeen and shot more than 50 people and 23 of them died. One of the survivors was a woman named Susanna Hupp. Um, and many of you may know her story. For those who don't, uh, she tended to legally carry a pistol with her in her car. Um, and she followed the law and left it in her car when she walked into Luby's that day. And she was haunted by the fact that she thought she might have been able to save some of the victims, including her mom and dad who were tragically killed in the assault. Um, Susanna Hupp became a spokesperson for changing the state's gun laws and her activism actually catapulted her to the state legislature around the turn of the 21st century. And you can see the cover of her book here. Um, so in 1995, Governor George W. Bush signed a law allowing licensed concealed carry. Um, and in 2015, Governor Rick Perry signed a law allowing license holders to openly carry their weapons as well. So now that's how we have what we have now, where if you have a license in Texas, you can either carry your handgun con concealed or openly. And shortly thereafter, remaining restrictions upon knives like Bowie knives were also taken away. Now the Luby shooting didn't randomly or immediately cause Texans and their state representatives to change their opinions about gun control. Rather, it was a flashpoint event that pulled many people who were already skeptical of gun control laws to abandon them as hopelessly ineffective. And this is a mentality or intellectual approach to the idea of gun control that characterizes the current Republican party and indeed all members of the gun rights side of our current gun debate. And so that sort of wraps up my comments. I really hope that I've persuaded you uh, and offered at least some form of an explanation as to how we got to where we are today. Um, now, I also promised that I would talk about how to discover whether or not your ancestor is a criminal. And I know that I have, uh, I may be running out of time, but I will try to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, you'll catch on, you'll catch on very quickly to the key in discovering whether or not your ancestor is a criminal. So you'll, you'll see that as we go through here. Um, one of the primary functions of county and municipal government is the enforcement of law and justice. Um, and you can find records for uh, records of this in your local county courthouse. Although you have to be aware that when you go back beyond, uh, you know, around 1900 or so, these records can be patchy. Um, now before, let's say you have the name of one of your relatives in mind and you've heard stories that maybe this person might have been someone who got arrested for something, okay? Um, you need their name. Um, now before arriving, you want to check and see whether or not the county in question has been inventoried. About 100 counties in Texas have had all of their, their county records that still exist inventoried. Um, and these are available for free online through the portal to Texas history. You can see here on the slide. The other thing you want to do is find out whether or not the county in question has an archive or an archivist. 
This is the archivist for Tarrant County, Don Youngblood. Um, archivists are very helpful. Um, and if your county happens to have one, uh, like Tarrant County does, they can, they can really ease the process of finding out whether or not your ancestor was a criminal. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Once you, I got these out of order. Once you have the name of your ancestor and you have the county where you think they lived, um, the first thing you wanna do is go and see about a criminal index book. The county court and district court have these. I don't have a picture of one because the Jefferson County District, uh, the Jefferson County clerk would not let me photograph it. Uh, but this is what, this is the kind of information you can get from a criminal index. You can get the date of the arrest and the case number, which is really important. And there's the name of, of the person. Now, when you go and look in a criminal index book, it will be organized alphabetically by last name. So if you have the name of your ancestor, all you've got to do is go to the index book and see if they appear. And that will tell you more than likely what offense they committed and when. Um, to go back, uh, once you have the case number, you can look at a case file. Case files have the indictment, um, they have the arrest warrant, things of that nature. You don't know how many documents they'll have, so it's kind of a, you know, it's a shot in the dark. You don't know what you're going to get. Now, once, once you've looked at the index book, and I really recommend going and looking at minute books. Minute books are the official proceedings of the district or county court. Um, these are really important because they have the judgments in them. Um, so the judgment is when the judge of the court judges whether or not someone is guilty or not guilty of a crime. And that's what we see here. Here you can see the case number in the left margin and then the name of the defendant. And then all that text is the judgment. And the judgment is just sort of a, a boilerplate. Uh, but it'll tell you whether or not the person's guilty and what their penalty is. Judgments, um, I'm sorry, minute books almost always have an index in the beginning pages of them, which are organized by uh, alphabetically by the last name of the defendant. So I hope you're getting the hang of how to, how to figure this stuff out. If you've got a name, you can find alphabetized indexes that will tie your ancestor to a case number. Um, in addition to county have fee books, that's what we're looking for. And just like minute books, um, fee books have an index in the beginning, which is organized alphabetically by the last name of the defendant. Um, and where minute books hold the judgments, so a judging whether or not the person is guilty, the minute books keep track of court costs including whatever the uh, fine is. And here on this one, if you trace fine over, you can see that this person was fined $25 for unlawfully carrying a pistol. And the total fine there in sort of the bottom central section of the image is $57.10. That's their total cost. Another item that you can find is a docket. Now dockets aren't necessarily indexed and if they are they may be done by case number so uh, they're a little more tricky to use. They were highly useful for me uh, but I wasn't looking for a specific person so these may be unwieldy if you're looking for a specific person. They're kind of an outline of what the court, uh, an outline of the activities of the court and they're often used for personal reference for the clerk or the judge so they might have really terrible handwriting or use confusing abbreviations things of that nature. Um, now, lesser misdemeanors like unlawfully carrying a pistol, they were not necessarily prosecuted in county or district court all the time. Often they were dealt with in lesser courts called justice of the peace courts. And I really loved these, okay? JP, JP docket books are highly useful because they combine the judgment and the, the fees into one page. So the whole case is dealt with in one page. You don't have the judgment in one book and the fee in another. It's all collapsed onto one sheet of paper. And so it's very um, e efficient in that way. Um, and you guessed it, JP docket books usually have an index in the beginning pages that are organized alphabetically by the last name of the defendant. So at this point, uh, I hope you are all ready to bombard your clerk's offices with requests to look at criminal records. Um, and having gone over my time, I will now turn it back over uh, to Dr. Schooley. Thank you, Brennan. Um, 
I want to say that I think that was super interesting. And the uh, the tips on tracking uh, someone's route through the court system, that was a very concise presentation for us because that can be a very complicated process. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to uh, offer some uh, questions. We're monitoring the chat. Uh, and uh, I have I have one question to start with, and that is, can you give us an example um, of someone trying to prove that they had a legitimate reason to be carrying a gun, um, say on that particular day? That was one of the one of the reasons they could carry was because that particular day they felt like there was an imminent threat. Uh, was anyone able to convince the court that that was the case? Well, for a lot of these, we don't have a lot of record, so it's hard to know what somebody's plea was or, or what they argued in their own defense, but I'm sure that some people were able to do this, and the way that it would work is that you would still get arrested, but and you'd still get put on trial, but you could plead almost self-defense. It's very similar to pleading self-defense. Let's say you kill someone in legitimate self-defense. You still get arrested and go to trial, but at the trial you have to prove that that the nature of your of your homicide was in self-defense. And so that's how this would work. These people would go to trial, they would plead not guilty by reason of you know fearing an imminent attack. And then the judge or the jury, depending on who was deciding the case, the judge or jury would then weigh the evidence and determine whether or not it was a reasonable fear um, and whether or not there was a reasonable um, attack that might happen. And so if it, if all of those criteria were met, the person could then be declared not guilty. So within a whole lot of the not guilty decisions, there are surely a lot of people who, um, who used that strategy when they defended themselves in court. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I know Dr. Rivas was really thorough, but surely there have to be some more questions. <laughs> okay, Linda, do you want to come back and join us as we wrap things up here? Sure. Uh, I see that you commented about the research strategy. Um, Love that. Well, and as a, and from the archivist side uh, of things, uh, then then you're saying yes that that's a, a really good way to go through that. Yes, and process. Dr. Rivas, you did a great job in describing that in a very concise, quick manner. Well, I was afraid that I was running out of time. You know, I could have spent more time on it, and I'm happy to elaborate in more detail if you think if you think your your audience might be interested in that. Well. We've got a few more minutes if you want to. Well, sure. Um, the the key is is the indexing, and for a minute for minute books, sometimes you have uh, like the separated index books, which will direct you to which volume of the of the minute books to find the case in. Um, and there are in some counties these wonderful like thousand page ledgers of indexes that tell you sort of the all the need to know information um, about a particular case. And for Jefferson County, which I went to, they had a fabulous collection of these index books. Um, and I had called the county clerk's office ahead of time and said, can I come down there and take photos? Because apparently the clerks are allowed to deny you the photo photographing. Um, and they said on the phone, yes, you can photograph the old records. Well, I showed up with my camera and the clerk herself came out and she almost threw me out of the office. She said I was not allowed to use my camera. So I had to set up a station back there with my laptop and just transcribe the information uh, as quickly as I could. And their index books had the name of the offender, the crime they committed and their case number um, all the way through at least the 1950s. That's as far as I got in my two days there. Um, and if I were able to dig around a little bit more, I could probably, they probably have books that go all the way up, you know, to digitization. Mm -hmm. um, so some counties have that, other counties don't. Like Fayette County, they didn't have that. So I had to, you know, read or skim through all those minute books and that was a real tedious, but the index books can be really helpful if you're a genealogy person and you're looking for a case about someone in your tree. Now, when sure. I was researching, I was looking for 
a crime and I didn't care who committed it. I wanted to find that out afterward. Um, but if you're approaching it from a genealogy perspective, having the name, it's amazing what all you can find. Um, and you can find the arrest warrant, which is called the Capius. Um, so it, it's really great. And it's uh, much easier if you're a genealogist starting out with a name. So I see maybe some more questions are popping yes, in. I'll yes. turn it over. Well, related to what, what you were just saying, um, maybe you can quickly say why the county clerk had such an issue with you taking photographs. Well, in a lot of counties where they have, uh, you know, folks doing deed record searches for oil and gas, they make a lot of money off of, um, off of people photographing documents. And she wanted me to use the, photo, the, the copy machine. If I had done that, I would still be, to this day, be in Jefferson County using that copy machine. It's just... <laughs> insane. The, and the ledgers are huge. You know, they're like, you know, more than two inches tall, uh, two feet tall. So they don't even fit on the, you can't even use regular copy paper to print it out. So um, that's why they wouldn't let me. Okay. We have another question uh, on um, resources about where to find further information about gun control advocacy in Texas. Did you come across any of that in your research? Uh, yeah, there's a, I'll type it in the chat box. There's an organization called Texas Gun Sense. Oh, I'm on all caps. And uh, that's a, a sort of lobbying or advocacy group that's active specifically in Texas. And their website is pretty useful. And they even have things like recommend, like recommendations that if you feel strongly about this, you can call your state rep um, and, and say that you support these specific changes that Texas Gun Sense advocates. Okay. Um, someone else had a question about uh, clarifying when Texas started uh, lessening their regulations. Was, was the Luby's event really the, the tipping point or sort of the inspirational point for that? You know, my sense of it is that, that as the Republican, the new Republican Party was, was coming into fruition or coming into form in the 70s and later, that that the idea of these gun laws started falling out of step with their approach to the idea of government regulations. Um, so I'm willing to bet that there was a, a growing, maybe even simmering skepticism or dislike for some of these laws for a longer period of time, maybe going all the way back into the 1970s or 80s. Um, and then it had grown enough that by 1991, that Luby's incident and the advocacy of Susanna Hupp was enough to bring things to a boil and really push the movement forward enough that once they got Ann Richards out of office, uh, they got the concealed weapon law passed. I see, okay. Um, another question, do you know of any case where a freedman was uh, able to successfully plead their case for carrying a firearm during that period from 1870 to say 1920s, uh, were they able to prove there was a real threat against them? You know, like I said, oh, exactly. your question a minute ago, it's really hard to know the details of what kind of defense people offered in their trials because we don't have the trial records. There's no transcript for, for these. But I will say that there are, uh, so two things, number one, some of the people who successfully pleaded not guilty and were found not guilty, either by a judge or a jury, some of those people were black. So there were African Americans who were successfully pleading not guilty and defending themselves in court. However, that became harder for them to do at this local county level as time went on. After about 1890, it became more difficult for them to be acquitted or found not guilty. Um, the second thing I would point this question or two is that the for appellate records, so the, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, and if you go far enough back, the Texas Supreme Court, these appellate criminal jurisdictions sometimes heard cases where the defendant was an African American. And what I found, I didn't track their race or ethnicity with anywhere near the same detail that I did with the local stuff, um, but what I found in what I did do with the appellate cases, it looked to me as though race was far less of an issue in the appellate jurisdictions and black defendants on appeal were about as likely to get an acquittal as white defendants, which for the most part was pretty unlikely. The court almost always affirmed uh, these deadly weapon ban convictions that were being appealed to them. Um, so 
I would, that would be my sort of non-committal answer to that question. <laughs> and if I could find a case like that, I would love it, but it's just so hard to know exactly what was being argued at the trial level in these cases. Uh, as a follow-up question, though, um, and for people who are maybe not as familiar with looking through records like this, um, was it difficult for you to determine uh, whether the, the person, when, once you found the category of records, uh, whether the person was uh, a person of color or uh, an Anglo person? Yeah, I had I had sort of naively thought that because race was such a determining factor in life at this time, that the case that the records themselves might just notate whether the person was white or not, but they didn't. Um, and in fact, what I had to do was I collected thousands and thousands of cases, and so I had thousands and thousands of names. It was so unwieldy, but I used statistical modeling to do a sample, a representative sample, and so I, I ended up doing. Uh, genealogical research on about 250 of my two or 3,000 people. And every time I couldn't find someone, I would pull in a new person from the sample. Um, and that way it was representative. So what I had to do was go into Ancestry.com and Genealogy Web and all of these sites that I'm sure your viewers are familiar with and start doing research on these people, especially in the census, to see where they lived and how old they were and what their racial background was. Okay. Very good. Do we have any other questions? Um, I do have one I want to share too that may help people finding these records. Um, in Texas, um, there are records that are at regional historical resource depositories at various locations throughout the state. So um, there may be some records in those that you need to explore too. And there's a link in the chat. Yeah, those uh, repositories can be so helpful. Um, and the idea is great. Uh, but when I went to one, they couldn't find the records that I was looking for. But you know, oh, when no. you have like however many tens of thousands of square feet of records, like the Sam Houston one uh, does, they they couldn't they couldn't find them. They had switched to those. Uh, those crank shelves, the roll, the move, mm -hmm. and somebody wrote down wrong where they put like you know feet and feet, of, um, and they couldn't find them for me. So, oh, but no. the but the idea is lovely, and I've had success yeah. in, in other places. So, okay, okay. Um, oh, we'll see. This may be a question or a comment. Um, it's a comment. Oh, yes, they rely on the counties to transfer the records to those sites. Right. Yes. Right. So there are many, many steps along the way there um, and places where things can get uh, where where transcriptions can get um, uh, mistaken. And so you got to get it all. They get it all straight eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're when you're sharing records like that, sometimes it takes a little time to get uh, to get everything organized where it can can be available to the public. And that's something that everybody needs to remember also is that. Um, even if a, a, if a repository has the records that you need, uh, they might not be available because there is behind the scenes processing that has to occur first before they can be made available uh, to everybody. Um, and, and that's just a, a matter of, of it being, being able to be tracked on the library side and protecting the records for all of their users. And yeah. also, uh, on that ahead. note, I'll just say one, one quick comment on that subject. Um, I had heard a story that sometimes the best thing to do is to show up and just demand to see the records, that, that sometimes clerks will, will not give you the time of day if you play nice with them beforehand. But in my experience, that was not the case, especially when you're looking at these old criminal records they often don't necessarily even know where they are. And that's not a poor reflection of clerks. It's just that this is very far from the top of their priority list most of the time. They're keeping track of new stuff. Um, yeah. And so it's very helpful if you call ahead of time. And that's why I brought up yes. the thing about counties that actually have a dedicated archives department. Um, they are so helpful. And you can talk to them on the phone and they can have the volumes that you're looking for pulled out. And that's someone who's dedicated to old records. 
and they are usually very well aware of what they have and they can even help you find yet more beyond what you thought you were looking for. Yes, and also a lot of times repositories have records that they store on site at another location and it may take a few days to get records retrieved from there. And so, um, you know, like if they're using something like Iron Mountain or one of those offsite storages, they put in a request for it and it can take a few days to get them back. And so if you only have a couple of days, it's definitely in your best interest that you, you know, let them know ahead of time what you're wanting to look at. So, and especially during our time of COVID currently, um, there's different procedures, places are closed. So always a good idea to call ahead. Uh, that's that's an excellent thing to note, and and that goes for courthouses as well. Yes. Uh, it, not just not just archival repositories, but but courthouses and uh, courthouse extensions uh, annexes as well, because that's exactly right. They most of these records, um, as I'm sure Brennan discovered, are stored in basements or tiny rooms off to the side in, inside the vaults. Uh, and there is not a lot of space in there. So it's going to, you know, for social distancing, you might only be able to allow one researcher at a time. So that's another reason that you, you want to plan and, and be flexible uh, in those situations during this particular time. Okay, anything else? Well, okay. I just want to say uh, thank you very much, uh, Brennan, for being with us today. You have shared so much interesting information. I think a lot of it we had not heard before. You've dug out some really interesting tidbits for us, not only about the deadly weapons laws of Texas, uh, but about those uh, who, who might have broken them. Uh, so, uh, so we really appreciate that. And uh, I will be providing a little follow-up information uh, on our Facebook page some of the books that she talked about today. I'll, I'll cite those there for those who might have missed them. Uh, and let me remind you uh, that, uh, that the program, the webinar recording will be available on YouTube uh, with, after a little bit of time for editing on the uh, Fort Worth Public Library's YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, much clapping for you in the, in the chat comments, Brennan, and, and from us too. And Linda, do you have uh, anything else to add? I don't believe so. Okay, well, thank you all. Re remember to join us on December 5th when Linda herself will be presenting on uh, James Toll's impact on the city of Fort Worth. Um, and until then, uh, y'all have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>